Once they had populated the entire Earth, human beings created colonies in which to live, which they called cities. These are artificial landscapes created by invention and culture, supposedly designed to meet the needs of Homo sapiens. The most advanced countries are proud of their great cities in which science, technology and commerce are concentrated. Several generations of human beings have now been born and have grown up in this man-made environment in which they feel safe because everything is for sale, if you can afford it. The victors of the system have increasingly broken their biological links and believe themselves to be free from their limitations as primates. But the system also has its losers. In order to feed these great urban monsters, an enormous supply network has been created covering the entire planet. In the new jungles of concrete and glass live millions of neo-carnivores who demand provisions each day and will accept no failure in the supply chain. In this new landscape, there is no dry season. Hunters do not celebrate the success of their expeditions and the prey have no biological identity. A hen is no longer a bird. It is chicken, simply food. A human being is an enigma, the result of the permanent conflict between his two main characteristics, culture and biology. The slow, gradual biological evolution has been overtaken by rapid cultural development. We use enormous quantities of energy of all types, a deadly sin in the wild, where we developed as a species. Our animal nature often can take it no longer and needs to get away, see a tree, do some physical activity, return to what we really are. The great global tribe has conquered all others. We have gone too fast. Our success as a species has been such that not everyone can keep up. So-called modern civilization waits for no one. Natural selection has been transformed into social selection, while the old clans now have the names of banks. The dominant social current takes no prisoners. You are either part of the system or you are an outcast, living at the margins. The price is starting to become too high. The side effects are all too frequent. Somewhere along the line, we perhaps lost our way. The old totemic animals, the protective spirits in which we had such faith, are now also ignored. On our planet, there are many ways of living on the edge and many circumstances which create beings with their own rules. Fortunately, still now in the 21st century, there remain some human populations whose way of life corresponds to the original forms of their ancient culture. These are the Himba, an ethnic group of nomadic herders in the Kalahari Desert in Namibia. They are victors, survivors who have conquered the desert and hunger. But they live outside the dominant culture, beyond the control of those who consider themselves to be civilization and so have become outcasts. The strange thing is that they have not changed in hundreds of years. It is the world that has changed around them. They conserve their own attitudes and customs, a different way of seeing the world. They have always been there, but without wanting to, they have become a curiosity for the great global tribe, which considers them a picturesque ethnic rarity. Only a handful of ethnic groups like the Himbas still survive in the world, and it is almost certain that sooner or later they will disappear as a culture. They have been left undisturbed because they live in an inhospitable, poor environment. But at any moment a multinational will discover something beneath their lands, or perhaps they will be influenced by the tourists, 
or a road will have to pass that way. But for the moment, the Himba remain alive as a culture. In this case, their marginalization is voluntary, and we can only hope it'll remain that way for the foreseeable future. Just as the Himba live outside the global culture, there is an animal on the other side of the world which has also found itself alone. In these shallow coastal waters of the Caribbean lives one of the few remaining populations of manatees in the world. The manatee belongs to the zoological order of the Sirenians. They are the only marine mammals that feed exclusively on plants, and for that reason they are sometimes called sea cows. They share a common ancestor with the elephants, but the Sirenians remained in the water. When some 38 million years ago the land climate became colder, the forests of marine plants receded and left them confined in just a few parts of the world. They are slow, trusting, pacific and enormous, weighing up to 1,600 kilos. The largest Sirenian, the Stella's sea cow, was exterminated by man in the 18th century and weighed 7,000 kilos. To make matters even worse, their meat is delicious, which is why they have always been massacred. In the 17th century, the Dutch merchants sent up to 20 ships a year to Europe, laden with manatee meat. Their docility, their low reproductive capacity, and their delicious meat do not bode well for survival in the modern world. Like the Himbas, for the moment they are still there, oddities marginalized from mammalian evolution. Biological evolution is a gradual process which began approximately 6,000 million years ago on Earth. In the course of time, there have been numerous branches which have separated from the main trunk. Here in the Galapagos Islands, geographical isolation led to the colonizing species evolving and adapting in unique ways, uninfluenced by what was happening on the large continents. Not only the archipelago as a whole, but even in many cases, each island imposed its own rules on the new arrivals. For those that can travel easily, such as the birds or marine mammals, this was not a problem. But for the land species, it was a matter of life or death. Five million years ago, these islands arose from the sea and so have never had any contact whatsoever with the continent of America, which lies some 1,000 kilometers away. The recently created volcanic soil received the first seeds and at some point the ancestors of this iguana must have arrived on board a drifting log. Here they did not find much food. But on the other hand, nor were there the legions of predators of the continent. So despite everything, they managed to survive. The turtles followed a similar process and thanks to this marginal evolution they reached incredible sizes with weights of around 200 kilos. Moreover, they developed into 14 different subspecies, some of them with notable morphological differences. The geographical isolation of the Galapagos Islands deprived these animals of the resources available to the mainstream majority but in exchange, it accelerated the adaptation process, creating its own particular survival strategies. But there are other factors that can separate a group of living beings from all others. Here on the plains of Venezuela, 
A series of climatological phenomena come together and determine the distribution of life and death in the course of the year. Inside the islands of forest scattered across the plain, the jungle species take refuge, protected from the sun out in the open. But these are limited spaces. The majority of the territory consists of an endless plain covering 300,000 square kilometers. While the large pools formed by the last rains remain, there is no problem. But little by little, the sun dries up all the water on the plain. The capybaras concentrate in increasingly numerous groups to take advantage of the shrinking pools. As occurred in the Galapagos Islands, those who can leave, such as the birds, permit themselves the luxury of staying until the very end to take advantage of the increasing abundance of fish and dead bodies. The others await the annual nightmare of the drought. There are more and more bodies and less water. For the spectacled alligator, this is the last banquet before things turn ugly. In just a few weeks, the piranhas will wish they had been eaten by the alligators rather than dying literally baked by the sun. In its seemingly unstoppable progress, the dominant cultural current on the planet is responsible for the vast majority of cases of dispossessed human groups. These people are Waoranis. They live in the tropical forests of Ecuador, but are being mercilessly attacked by the great global tribe. Big cities need oil. In them, everyone lives at one end of the city but works at the opposite end. And every day they create enormous traffic jams which consume millions of barrels of crude oil. Many of these barrels come from here. Beneath the ancestral lands of the Warani lies oil which has not been extracted, yet. In the middle of the 1960s, oil was discovered in eastern Ecuador. As this mineral wealth is exploited, networks of routes and roads Helicopter landing bases and facilities for the workers are built. The rivers and the subsoil are contaminated with sulfates, cyanide and mercury. But even worse, if possible, is the destruction of cultures such as that of the Warani, who are invited to move to prefabricated houses and see their lands for oil extraction. Then they lose their identity, they abandon their traditional customs and adopt the vices of the attractive consumer society. The once proud warriors of the jungle are now strange hybrid figures wearing feathers and tracksuits. The oldest yearn for their old way of life, but they will soon die and the young born in the settlements will simply add to the numbers of the world's dispossessed.
Crossing the Atlantic in Africa, another ethnic group of born survivors is about to disappear as a result of destructive Western influences. The San, or Bushmen, always lived incredibly well adapted to the deserts of Namibia and Botswana as hunter-gatherers, an anachronistic system of life for which there would seem to be no place in our agricultural and industrial society dominated by the global economy. Already less than 5% of the San continue this traditional way of life. The rest have been rehoused by the Botswanan government in ghettos, where they are provided with water wells and a small state subsidy in exchange for doing nothing. And naturally, they get bored. The mythical Bushmen who had inhabited southern Africa since prehistoric times with their own unique language and physical characteristics were first forced out by the black Bantu peoples and later decimated by the European colonists. Once they had been corralled into the poorest lands that no one else wanted, such as the Kalahari and Namib deserts, they managed to survive until now. But they are losing the fight to whiskey, beer and drugs, the only thing the civilized members of the great global tribe taught them to use. Now they live on tiny, miserable plots of lands with 100 square meters of nothing and a future of cultural extermination. As they never registered their lands, as they do not have accounts in any bank, they are no one. These people never wanted for anything while they maintain their traditional way of life. Though it might seem hard to believe, the daily life of the hunter-gatherers permitted a degree of leisure and a quality of life that cannot be matched in the modern Western cities, except by the upper classes, and even then their health and longevity were almost comparable with ours. Now, everything is different. Throughout the planet, we can find many similar stories. The Australian Aborigines are also an ancient people of expert hunter-gatherers who little by little have been driven out by the global culture. But why does this happen? What are the origins of this phenomenon? It is a slow process, a clear example of human ecology, which can be traced back to the Neolithic age, when men and women began to develop agriculture and livestock breeding, abandoning the old system of hunting and gathering. Hunter-gatherers move around from one place to another, catching animals and eating the seasonal fruits of the plants. As a result, they don't have many personal belongings, and there is a great equality in the wealth of individuals. Nor do they claim the land. Quite simply, when there is no more hunting or the fruits run out, they move on to another area. But agricultural peoples are very different. They invest a great deal of time and effort in looking after the land, and therefore defend it, considering it to be their property. They put up fences and so establish the basis of differences. If you have a lot of land, you get rich. If not, you have to work for someone else in exchange for a salary. In this way, cities and private property were born, the product of agriculture with surpluses. However, these Aborigines, like the San and many others, clung to the old system of hunter-gatherers, and in time we have fenced in more and more land until they have been left with nothing. To ease their consciences in the face of this flagrant theft of their lands, the respective governments offer them little prefabricated houses and an allowance in exchange for giving up their traditional practices. They then simply disappear, consumed by alcoholism and drugs. They are unable to cope with the dark side of the dominant civilization. All this is happening right now before our very eyes, and in the whole world, barely a handful of organizations are fighting against it. Struggles for land have been merciless throughout the history of humanity. Cambodia. In this land, humans have sown the seeds of death. Over 20 years of wars have left the legacy of approximately 10 million landmines scattered around the entire country. So he said, no problem, he will let 
2,500 Cambodians have been trained to deactivate these mines and with the invaluable help of the NGOs have managed to clear around 10 million square kilometers. Each detection and deactivation costs approximately $1,000, an incredibly high price for the Cambodians, which they could not pay alone. The country is infested with mines. There are at present over 35,000 amputees, and every day they are joined by 10 more mutilated people. Every attempt to cultivate the land here means risking death or invalidity. A number of care centers try to ease the suffering of the victims as much as possible, offering them shelter and medical attention. They also provide psychological support services and make false limbs which help some 1,000 people a year to walk again. Paradoxically, many of these victims find work making wheelchairs. But the majority of the mines are still there, waiting for someone to stand on them and so create one more social outcast or one more shattered corpse. The most highly developed primate on the planet with his enormous brain has advanced so fast that he has often forgotten that diversity is a source of richness. For 40 years, the Tibetan people have been suffering a gradual cultural genocide carried out by the Chinese government. Tibetan identity is quite simply being crushed. The Chinese government provides incentives for its people to settle in Tibetan territory, allowing them to have two children there instead of one as in the rest of the country. It also backs prostitution and helps the Chinese to set up the best businesses, taking them away from the local Tibetan population. In 1958, the Chinese army invaded Tibet. Since then, over one and a half million Tibetans have died, murdered in Chinese jails, and around 130,000 have fled the country and are trying to protect their culture and Buddhism in neighboring countries such as Nepal and India. The Tibetans are forced to cross the highest mountains on the planet on a dangerous three-day journey on foot in order to reach Kathmandu, the capital of neighboring Nepal, and from there on to Dharmasala. Many die on the way and those that make it arrive with serious frostbite, which is treated in reception centers on the other side. From here, they will be distributed to the different Tibetan settlements in Indian territory. China seeks to deliberately destroy the Tibetan culture. It hates the religion, the language, and the spirituality of these people, who it has turned into outcasts in their own country. Is this the price we have to pay in order to maintain the so-called welfare society? Perhaps too high a price. Nature has taught us that such imbalances will sooner or later turn against us all. Perhaps the outcasts will disappear first, but in the end the system will collapse in any case if we don't remedy the situation in time.